background, I think I explained, is I'm a recovering venture capitalist. I spent 17 years in Silicon Valley, 12 of which I was investing in early stage companies, and I was mostly investing in early stage companies in Europe. So I spent a lot of time in Scotland, in Ireland, and, and just about everywhere else in Western Europe looking at early stage companies and benchmarking them against what was going on in the Valley. So I have, I have uh, a perspective that maybe dates back further than, than this conversation. Uh, and I've got a couple thoughts about what uh, an ecosystem in Scotland would look like and how you might get there. And I'll throw that out there. It, it's going to be fast, and it's probably going to elicit um, at least some reaction. And that's my point. So I think the debate should happen uh, continuously. And let me see if I can throw some meat into the ring and, and get, get people fighting about it. So I have, an, I have a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that in this room, there is a subset of people that can make this a reality. That an ecosystem can be built in Scotland to create 60 plus web tech companies a year. And that within three to four years of launching this from today, you guys could have three one billion pound exits out of that, that effort. Okay? That may sound fantastical, but Boulder has done something equally amazing with 100,000 people in it. Okay? So if you believe Paul Graham, startups, startup hubs and ecosystems require three basic essentials, right? What are they? You want to take a guess? Bridges, cigars, and hoodies. <laughs> Nerds, rich people, and a place that they want to live. Nerds is a heuristic for smart people doing things, building things, right? Entrepreneurs. Rich people is capital, and the place they want to live is a place where they're all going to meet, right? San Francisco has, as Brian pointed out, all of those things. Quality of life, great weather. And a heuristic for figuring out if you're in a place that people want to live is often the real estate is expensive, right? The demand for real estate outstrips the supply, so housing is expensive and everything else is expensive as well. I think Scotland qualifies in that regard. More important than those three things, those are essential but not sufficient. More important than those three things are what you see in Silicon Valley, okay? And the reason Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley has less to do with the weather and less to do with the, the freeways and the, and the abundance and density of multinationals. It has more to do with an attitude. And I po posit that if Scotland wants to be a startup hub and a world-class player in the, in the entrepreneurial space, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that begins it and it's an attitude that carries it through. And so if you guys want this to happen, it's a mindset that you're going to have to adopt if you haven't already done so. It's a set of nested beliefs that are built on each other that allow this to occur, right? If you go to Silicon Valley, anybody, so show of hands of people that have spent any time in Silicon Valley. Okay, quite a bit. I, I, I would guarantee that as soon as you step off the plane in Silicon Valley, you can feel it, right? There is a sense that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday, right? I call this violent optimism. It's in the air everywhere in the valley, right? It is a sense that anything is possible. And there's enough evidence now that that's true, that you can go from T0 to billion dollar Facebook acquisition in two years with a pivot along the way, as Instagram did, right? There's enough stuff happening and everybody can see it all the time to believe it. But it didn't start that way. It wasn't always like that, right? 55 years ago, 60 years ago, Silicon Valley was a set of apple orchards. There was nothing going on except a little bit of defense contracting, okay? Silicon Valley is where it is today because of an attitude. Another thing that you see in these startup hubs, Boulder, Austin, Seattle, Silicon Valley, New York, Boston to a degree, is that they all embrace, the cultures embrace diversity. Diversity of thought, background, aliens, illegal and otherwise, are embraced, and youth. 
there's an important aspect of youth. And if you look in the valley, some of the biggest things that have happened have come from people that have never done anything before in their lives, right? That embrace of youth is key. Contrarian thinking is allowed, if not encouraged. It is allowed, right? And this is a hard one because contrarians, true contrarians, look like wingnuts, right? They look like dangerous people. But in these places, there's enough space for those people to exist. And just inside the circle from those radical thinkers are other thinkers creating disruptive ideas that end up getting funded. So you have to allow for the weirdos to create space for entrepreneurs that are going to do big things. All these places operate on a meritocracy to a, a greater or lesser degree. It matters less where you're from, where you went to school, what your name is, and how far back your lineage goes, and more about what skills you bring to the equation, right? It's not a pure meritocracy even in the valley, but that is valued more than your collected history. There's a deep sense and understanding of risk and reward, right? We all talk about risk and reward. Risk equals reward in the entrepreneur's mind, but the corresponding issue is that risk often means failure. And you have to live with and accept that every time you take a risk, the chance is greater that you're going to fail than succeed and, and proceed anyway. So in these places, risk-taking is celebrated. Not just the outcome when it works, but the actual risk-taking itself. And that also means embracing failure, right? If you've spent any time in the valley, you will know that for every Instagram, there's probably a thousand failed photo sharing startups that have raised some money. The whole valley and everything in it, Facebook, Apple, Google, Zynga, Twitter, are built on the carcasses of hundreds and hundreds of failed startups. And that's good because when those startups fail, all the nutrients the furniture, the office space, the engineering talent gets reabsorbed into the system and put into a different startup. That's how it functions. Failure fuels the valley. Okay? So you have to be okay with failure. And look at it as, this is good. This means I'm closer to success. And if you're going to accept failure and you're also going to go for a big reward, you got to take a lot of shots on goal because most of them are probably not going to work. The more shots on goal, the more likelihood that you're going to have a big exit. So where does Scotland stack up in this, in my humble opinion? Okay? On the positive side, you've got plenty of nerds here. Right? You've got world-class universities filled with brilliant people doing really innovative stuff in research. We can have a whole debate about tech transfer. I think Brian brought this point up. It's excellent, and universities need to let this stuff out, and generally they're not very good at it. But let's take that to the side. You've got innovation and research here in spades. Nobody's going to debate that. You have rich people here. Okay? Some of them are sitting in the room. A lot of them are not. But you've got the capital. You have a place that people want to live. The weather sucks, but you've got a culture here that people want to, want to avail themselves of. Right? You have a strong independent streak, okay? I'm not sure it's always activated in this direction, but you have a strong independent streak. Youth, diversity, and an embracing culture are here, right? It's a young country. There's a lot of energy here that can be harnessed. And you've got a strong brand, a strong Scottish national brand. The world loves you. And world-class universities. Here's where you guys might fall short. Lack of confidence. I've never spent time in a place where this is more true. You have all these things on the left, and yet you can question yourself constantly. right? And this isn't just a casual observation. I've been coming here on a regular basis 10, 15 times a year for a decade. And we're having the same conversation we had a decade ago. right? It's time to do something. You're not violent optimists. okay? Recognize that. And that's a choice. 
It's just a choice. I would say there's too much government coddling here in the sense that, no offense to my Scottish uh, enterprise colleagues in the audience, but outsourcing your business development or outsourcing your market research to Scottish enterprise as a startup, bad idea. That's where you're going to learn about what the customers really want. Don't let somebody do that for you. Okay? You're tight-fisted, right? It's hard to pry money out of you guys for anything. <laughs> Recognize that too. That if you want this to be a really vibrant startup culture, you got to spend some money. You got to actually invest in things. You got to take more shots on goal. I would say generally, maybe the people in this room notwithstanding, there's a general fear of failure. It's a natural human instinct, right? Nobody likes to fail. But you got to get over it. You got to choose to get over it. You don't celebrate risk taking nearly as much as you should. And so this embrace of failure, I think, is the biggest thing that needs to change here, right? What's the worst that could happen? You lose some money as an angel investor, or you lose some time as an entrepreneur, or your money, right? The government's giving you a tax scheme that allows you to get 105% of that lost money back. I, I don't see where the real risk is. So how do you do this? How do you actually create this thing, right? You've got to change the, the culture here. That's, that's a, simple, uh, a, a simple thing to do. It's not easy. But it can be done. And it can be done literally with the people in this room. If you look at Boulder and the example that Brian gave, Brad Feld, that leader, the guy with the cool glasses, right, has a recipe and he'll describe it and does describe it on his blog. You should all go read it, right? There are five things that need to happen. First, you need to understand leaders versus feeders. Who is the leader? Who are the leaders? And who are the people that are supporting the leaders? The feeders are government, venture capitalists, angel investors, accountants, lawyers, etc. The ecosystem around the entrepreneur. It's the entrepreneurs that need to lead. I've heard a lot of discussion on this trip and previous trips about how the angel community in Scotland just doesn't get it. Guess what? They don't get it in the valley either. Right? They look like they do, but they're just further ahead than where you are today. The angels in the valley are led by the entrepreneurs. It's always been this way, and it will always be this way. The people that decide, right, you need a set of entre committed entrepreneurs. Brad says a minimum of six, the more the better, but a minimum of six need to decide they're going to change this and make a 20-year commitment to doing it in their minds. They need to think 20 years out, what do we want this place to look like, and let's start working on that stuff today. Work backwards from a 20-year vision. Hopefully it won't take that long, but you need to be prepared to commit that much time. You need to welcome everybody into the community, right? This is everybody that wants to put energy into this system, needs to be encouraged to do so and welcomed. Embrace diversity. And you need to engage the entire entrepreneurial stack. That means everybody needs to be addressed and reached out to actively to be brought into this. Okay? The lawyers, the angels, the VCs, the first-time entrepreneurs, the students, anybody that wants to participate needs to be brought in. And don't blame the angels. Don't blame the angels for what the entrepreneurs need to do. The angels will follow if you're inspiring them to do so. Okay? But I want to reiterate, it needs to be led by entrepreneurs, and it needs to be a 20-year commitment. Uh, we'll skip through this. We've already talked about this. Angels are the way they are because they made their money the way they made their money. So they invest in things that they know, right? They look for things that don't have much risk. So what do these four companies have in common? Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. Other than someone under 25. 
that had never ever done anything before in their lives. Right? None of these people were business people. In fact, none of them when they started actually thought about starting a business. They had no business plan. Google took three years after they took clients' money to figure out what their model was. And today, those companies, you know, depends on what happens with Facebook stock, but those companies collectively represent more than a trillion dollars in market capitalization. All started on an idea that was not a business. Those are the returns in multiples that their investors got at the early stage. Okay? The angels made some 100x multiples on these investments by basically taking a risk. Where there was no business plan, they were investing in somebody that had never done anything that looked like a dangerous contrarian thinker to, to the average person, and it worked out, right? Okay, so everybody's sitting there saying, Brendan, those are outliers. Those are huge outliers. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. But if you look at everything else, it usually starts that way too, right? None of these companies look like real businesses. Skype, Twitter, Instagram, Zynga, they all look like toys when they first started. So if you're an angel investor or a VC, what you should really be looking for is something that has massive potential disruptive power. That's really hard to see early, early on. So a heuristic for that is when you're looking at the product and technology, it's probably going to look like a toy, not a business. So if something comes to you as an angel investor or VC, looks like a toy, has no business model, no revenue model, pay attention. Okay? Great team, somebody that's hyper smart, right? But instead of being the sort of fundable business person with a lot of experience, what you probably really should be looking for is somebody that has no experience, but a lot of audacity and a lot of insolence and a lot of unreasonable thinking, right? The no experience piece means that they don't know what's not possible. Meaning everything is possible. And I guarantee you, everybody that met Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg told them what they were thinking was not possible. And yet, we have Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. These people need to be inflexible. So the more insolent, the more, the more stubborn this entrepreneur is, the better off you probably are as an investor. And the key for web and tech startups is that they need to understand, as do their investors, that Revenue models, early, early revenue models are probably irrelevant. What you really care about is user growth at a hyper level. If something is scaling really fast and adopting, being adopted really fast, it's probably a reasonable bet to make as an investor, right? And the number one thing, Paul Graham uses this, this is his coin term, Relentless resourcefulness. Bet on entrepreneurs that might not know what they're doing, but they're going to do something. Okay? This relentless resourcefulness to figure things out, solve problems that almost seem intractable, and never give up is what you really want. The business model will change. The idea will probably pivot. But at the end of the day, you want to back people that are going to get there no matter what. So how do you get started? And then we'll finish. Recognize that entrepreneurs lead. Angels and VCs follow, as does everybody else. The goal would be to find the next great entrepreneur here. Right? To do that, you need to take a lot more shots on goal than are being taken in Scotland today. I would say 10x more. Early stage investments. To do that, with the same amount of capital, unless you're going to have this huge influx of capital, you've got to reduce the amount of capital on each shot. Okay? So Seed Camp is a perfect example of how this works. Instead of giving a startup 500000 give them fifty, and see how relentlessly resourceful that entrepreneur is with that 50000 If they turn out to be extraordinarily so, double down. 
right? This is the Y Combinator seed camp Techstars model and it's working fabulously. So if you were to create, if this group in this room were to create a 10 million pound fund in Scotland that invested 50,000 pounds per, in the next three years you could create 180 startups. And that little asterisk, asterisk is just to point out that that is with a management fee of 2%. So you could pay somebody to actually run this fund and start 180 companies in three years. You'd be looking for black swans, things that, that occur infrequently, but if they succeed or survive, have disruptive potential to change the market. And if you do this, I would take 5,000 of that 50,000 and I would insist that entrepreneur or that founding team go to Silicon Valley for two weeks just like these guys do. Take them to Silicon Valley and make them fundraise and make them do customer development, right? So that they get that learning and bring it back here. I would fund it privately. I would not leave it up to Scottish Enterprise or the government to figure this out. I would do it amongst yourselves or the wider set of concentric circles of investors and people that you know and engage the entire stack and embrace failure. So when one of these companies, one of these 180 startups fails, double down and invest in two more. And in three years, I guarantee, well, that's, that's a little strong. I wouldn't guarantee it, but I'd bet that you'd have some disruptive success.